Hey everybody, it's your girl Herbal Farm Sister. Good evening everyone and welcome. Welcome back to my broadcast. <laughs> So this evening, we're going to talk about uh, food and why it's essential. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, some of the important things such as food storage as well as meal prepping. And so I have two guests with us here this evening. We have Kyra Barr and we have Aaron Olinger. Um, good, evening. good evening. So... Would you guys like to introduce yourselves real quick before we get started talking about why food is essential and things like that? You go ahead first, Kyra. Okay. My name is Kyra Barr, and I am a homeschooling mother of four, and I love sharing information on nutrition, health, and healing from a natural perspective, hence the name The Healing Way. Wonder. I'm a disaster preparedness uh, specialist. That's what I specialize in. And uh, today I want to talk a little bit about setting up your food pantry, water, water storage, and setting up long-term food storage. Your mic is muted, Nadia. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Oh, um, so yes. Thank you both for coming on this evening to discuss, um, you know, food and why it's essential. Uh, I know everybody the news broadcast of, you know, um, there's food shortages. Our food supply chain is being slowly depleted. Um, there's a... There's some issues with, you know, um, different companies shutting down, You're not going to be able to buy certain things, you go to the grocery store, a lot of the shelves are still empty. So I wanted to come out here and talk about what we can do to fix that issue on our own, in our own homes and things. And I know one thing that you all can do, and I'm just going to start out talking about, you know, setting up a garden um, at your home. Um, so there's many things that you can actually grow at your homes, even if you live in an apartment that you can actually use to uh, supplement, you know, food and things in. So things like, um, you know, tomatoes, peppers, zucchini, onions, garlic, herbs, squash, all types of things can be grown by you. So you don't have to actually resort to the grocery store uh, for those things. Now there's other things like say you live in Ohio or you live even further up north, you may not be able to get access to or actually grow things like citrus and things like that. But there's a lot of things that you can actually grow in your own backyard or, or on your decks and things. And, you know, I have plenty of videos. I have plenty of, um, <clears throat> you know, classes, courses, all types of things that will offer you, you know, lessons on how to get started with that. But first we're going to talk about with uh, Aaron. He's going to explain to us how to go about, um, how to go about, you know, he's going to show us a, you know, a setup that he has and things like that. So, Aaron, would you like to go ahead and okay. get started? Right now, if you're wanting to be disaster preparedness ready, that could be for riots, anything mother nature, anything man-made. Even if you want to be prepared for the coming food shortages that, and product uh, interruptions that we're going to start seeing in the near future, you have to start to set up a pantry of daily products that you use daily. And one of five things that you should be working on, this is gonna be an order of importance, is you should be stocking water, food, medicines, anything that gives relief, including prescriptions, fuel, and some form of self-defense. Now you can get into other categories, but those are the primary five that you should be preparing. Now today, I wanna to cover a little bit about food and water. And what I'm going to do for you right now is show you how to set up some long-term food storage. Now, your food storage should be set up in four categories. The first category is going to be your perishables. Those are going to be 
things that are in your deep freeze in your refrigerator. When the power goes out, your refrigerator is going to be good for 24 hours. Your deep freeze would be good for 36 hours. Then the food will begin to spoil unless you have a means of dehydrating or, or jerking the beef or salting it down or whatever to try to preserve it beyond that period. Uh, second category would be food that has a shelf life of, say, a year to, to almost eight, to 10 years. That's going to be your medium storage food that you're going to put back. Most of that is going to be easy to prepare food that requires very little energy. And you'll be able to uh, cook it with no more than maybe a fire and just maybe boiling water or just heating up the can because a lot of that food you'll be able to eat straight out of the can. And then your third category is going to be long-term food storage, which I'm going to do a demonstration to show you how to set that up. And then your last category is going to be a renewable food source. That's going to be your gardening, your seed bank that you're going to put back, and uh, any sort of animals you choose to raise, like chickens, rabbits, or say bluegill if you got aquariums, so that you can have a renewable meat source. That's your four categories. Now, if you're going to do long-term food storage, and those are going to be foods that's going to last between 10 to 30 years, you're going to have to get certain products. I'm going to show you what they are. One, you're going to need five-gallon buckets. Now, on the bottom of the bucket, in that little triangle I have there, there's a number two. That means food grade. That's what you want to look for. There'll be number ones, number threes, number fours. Everybody says that you can use ones and threes. I don't want to fool with those because sometimes buckets are used asbestos to give the bucket strength. I don't want asbestos around nowhere around my food. So I stick with food grade buckets, which are number two buckets. And that that's there'll be a triangle on the bottom of the bucket, and it'll say a number two. Don't have to be white, they could be any color, just as long as that two's on there, that means it's food grade. Then you're gonna want to go out and get you something, you get them in the paint department. And these are gamma seal lids. Those will run anywhere from probably eight to uh, twelve dollars. They have them in the paint department. They use them as resale buckets to keep five gallon cans of paint good. But these have, and I don't know, you can see that white band going around there. That's a rubber seal, so that they have an airtight seal when you shut shut the lids off. Now most buckets, if you buy them. I come with a regular white lid, but it takes a hammer to put these on the buckets. And then in order to get them loose, you're going to need a long handle screwdriver. You're going to need something called a bung wrench that you reach around and you grab a hold of the bucket and you peel the lid off. And if you lose this, you lose access to get into your buckets. So I'd rather pay the extra money and get the gamma seal lids. And that, that's going to give you complete access to be able to get in and out of your buckets and put an airtight seal back on. And the next product that you're going to want to acquire would be called a package of oxygen absorber. What those do is they draw the air out of a bag because air ages food and makes it stale. Air, sunlight, and moisture are the enemies of food and it will ruin your food. So to get the air out of a bag, you have to have oxygen absorbers. And then the next item you want to acquire, these are called Mylar bags. Super strong, almost made of what I call space age, aluminum and metal and plastic that it has on the inside. And if you fold them and open them up, you can see it makes four squares. Now you could put that Mylar bag inside of a bucket and use it as a liner. You can fill that bag totally up with nothing but the, uh, with just beans or say oats, grits, spaghetti, any sort of dry product that you want to store for a long-term period. Once you cut, if you want to make what I call a variety bag, box, bucket, you just cut those little pieces in little squares. Now I have ends that are open and you iron those shut. When you iron those shut, you can make what I call a little two pound bag. And you see how I put my hand in it. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna demonstrate 
I'm going to take a pack, a one pound bag of black beans. And all I'm going to do is tear this bag open. And I pour it down into the Mylar bag. Once you get all the contents into the bag, and all you want to do is open up your uh, oxygen absorbers, and I've got a can already open here. And you take one or two of them out, and you put your extras into a ball canning jar so that they keep them good and fresh for the next time you need to use some more of them. Stick these down inside the bag. Hold the bag over. Have your little piece of wood. And you're just going to lay this down on the wood and iron the outer edge shut. So you will have to have an iron. So I just lay this down. And I run that hot iron over the end of it. Then I turn it over, I'm going to iron the opposite side. Hey, Aaron, can you angle the camera yeah. down just a little bit so people can see what you're ironing? Uh, okay. I pull it let back a little. Uh, let me see if I can move it back some. Can they see me ironing now? Got yes, iron we can here. see now. I can. Yeah, we can see it now. And just iron the end up. Now your iron's going to be almost as hot as setting. It will not melt the bag. A lot of people are afraid it's going to melt the bag. Now, if you iron both sides of that bag, that's to make sure there's no pinhole leakers anywhere. Now you let that bag sit out overnight, and by the next day, that bag's going to pull in around the food. Now you can stick this down in your bucket, and after your bucket is full. You can put your uh, gamma seal lid down on it, and then you start to store your buckets. You just start stacking them up. Now, if seeing that I have this one bucket set up with a uh, mylar bag in it, if I want to fill this up with just rice, 50 pounds of rice or 50 pounds of beans, then this bucket's going to weigh 50 pounds. So I want you to expect that. But in this particular case, I was setting up what is called a variety bucket. I'm going to have one pack of black beans. I have five pounds of all-purpose flour. I have five pounds of sugar. And I've already made, this is 20 pounds of Uncle Ben's rice. Then I added to it a jar of raw honey. And for flavoring the rice, some chicken and herb bouillon cubes. These have a long shelf life. Now by using the Mylar bags, I'll give you an example of the lifespan that it adds to your product. Grits has a two year shelf life. By repackaging it in Mylar bags, now you can get 15 years off of a, of a container of grits. White rice has a five year shelf life. By doing that, I just gave that pack of Uncle Ben's rice 25 to 30 year shelf life. Flour, any of these products can be kept long term. Once you start stacking your buckets up, turn the camera around. Can you see that clearly? Yes. Okay. The buckets? Yeah. Yes, I can see it. Okay. You just start stacking your buckets. Now, if you don't have much room in your refrigerator, I mean, if you're in an apartment or retirement home, these buckets can be stacked too high across your uh, closet and still have room to hang your clothes. So you can utilize the bottom of your closet. Each one of these buckets are going to weigh between 30 or 50 pounds, depending upon how much dry food you put back. And you just extended the life of them to almost 25 to 30 years. 
You don't want to go with that. They have a product by Weiss. This is a freeze-dried food that you just add boiling water to. You wait 10 or 15 minutes, it reconstitutes itself. But right now, for whatever reason, the government is buying it up. It's getting very hard to find. And another product that's getting hard to find are the uh, military emergency meals. These are called the MREs, meals ready to eat. They have a thousand calories per each meal. They have desserts in them, beverage powder, pork, uh, spices, different things. And the newer ones are much better than the older ones used to be. These have between a uh, six to eight year shelf life. So this will fall under your medium category of storage food. Then I'm gonna move the camera again. Okay. Then I wanna talk about rice for a second. Mm -hmm. One of the main staples you should have, this is brown rice here, is going to be rice. And if you can't afford to buy in bulk, these little bitty packs of the Nors, rice and pasta sides are great. They're only a dollar. So this is very affordable for the average person that you can stock up. I keep a couple cases of these on hand. The rice, the Nor rice sides themselves will have a four to five year shelf life. The brown rice, because it has oil in it, only has a four-year shelf life. Any product, peanut butter, pasta, dark pasta, brown rice, anything that has oil in it is only going to have a four-year shelf life because after four years, the uh, rice is going to go rancid. The oil in it does. Okay. So along with going with rice, and rice is going to be your main staple. You definitely want to have it. It's going to fill a lot of bellies, and it's easy to store. Next product that you're going to want to have, can you see? Next product that you're going to want to have, I don't know if I can get, squeeze this in. There we go. Is going to be beans. Like I've got dry pinto beans here. Okay. They give a lot of protein, a lot of iron. And if you don't want to go with canned beans, you can go with, uh, I mean, uh, bags of beans, you can go with canned beans. Okay. Also found that I like the, uh, what they call, uh, refried beans, green beans, anything of that. Any sort of bean is going to be ideal to put back in there. If you don't have a renewable meat source, the beans themselves are going to give you the protein that you need. And another item that you're going to want to have will be pasta. You can have different forms of spaghetti. You can have dark. You can have the light. You can buy the big, big cases that they have in the warehouses. And even in the back, I have uh, a case of Kraft macaroni and cheese, 18 boxes. Very simple to make. All you're talking is hot, hot boiling water. And you just about got a meal. Pasta itself has a lot of carbohydrates, which for your brain and your body, you're going to need that. So ideal to have. Along with that, I don't know if you can see up here on top shelf, I have about a year's worth of toilet paper for a family of four, even though it's just me. But you never <laughs> know who show up to the party uninvited. That was a hot commodity. A few months ago. <laughs> and, and that's what you got to stock because you don't know. And as I already showed you, you're going to want to stock flour because flour is a, is a great product to have for coating your food. And also, if you plan on baking any sort of bread, you're going you're gonna to have to have the flour. Then along with flour, I recommend stacking up spices. As you can see, let me see right here. Got the Mortons, I got Lowry's, onion, black pepper, got basil, got turmeric, garlic, cinnamon. I have many spices. If you, if you want people to eat healthy, they're going to need spices. In the back here, I have uh, Swiss Miss milk chocolate mix. Again, you can mix that with milk or just water. 
and have something hot to warm somebody with in the wintertime or it could be a treat food in the summertime. I have jars of jam. And an important staple to have is going to be peanut butter, again, for the protein. And again, mixing the jam with the peanut butter, you've got something to eat. Up top, I have queso cheese sauce. I got cans of ragu spaghetti sauce. I got barbecue sauce. Also, I have red hot sweet chill. And I have jars of salsa. These all have pretty long shelf lives. And they totally change the flavor of the food. Uh, again, with, with the uh, ragu, the spaghetti sauce, the cheese sauce, and the uh, barbecue sauce, you can actually change the flavor of food totally. I mean, if you're eating something you're not used to eating, like maybe squirrel or raccoon meat or a rabbit, put enough barbecue sauce on it or <laughs> put enough ragu on it and everything either tastes barbecue or it tastes Italian. So you don't have to worry too much about that. <laughs> um, let's see. Going on the other side, spices. I do recommend people get this. This is pancake mix. All you need to make pancakes with this is just hot water, just some sort of water. And you're making pancakes at that point. This is a big 10 pound bag. Uh, I'm gonna add another one to it. I've been using out the other one that I've got. But again, if you don't have syrup, you don't have syrup, but you have jelly, you have fresh fruit, or you have honey, as long as you got the ability to make pancakes, you're filling bellies up. And that's important to have. That pancake mix itself has long shelf life. So if you repackage it in the Mylar bags, you can just about double the shelf life on that pancake mix. And I do recommend doing that. Then if you want to get into cereals, as you can see, I like Cheerios, the honey nut. You can eat that dry or you can eat it regular. I also have a big case of the uh, Quaker Oats. Again, long shelf life on this. Repackage it in the Mylar bags and get about 20, 30 years out of it. Definitely a staple that you'll want to have. Also, I have cases of corn, cases of green beans. Up top, I have cases of canned fruit as well as individual cans. Now, fruit between the canned vegetables, the canned meat, and the canned fruit. The canned fruit is going to go bad the quickest. It's because of the sugar that's in it. And some of them cans, if you keep them long enough, they will explode after a while. But right. that's something that you're going to have to rotate out and keep up on what, you're, what you've got available. Then another staple that you're going to want to have, let me see if you can see it. Okay, right here. Arm & Hammer baking soda. This is a huge bag of it. With baking soda, if you're going to do any sort of baking of bread, uh, say baking of bread, if you're going to, that, that by itself would make it worth having. But you can also use it to clean wounds with, you can clean, clean surfaces. You can put it, if you run out, out of laundry detergent, you can put it in your laundry to clean your clothes with. A uh, super multiple use item. So mm -hmm. that's, that's something you're going to want to have. Uh, you're going to want to have bags of sugar. Uh, let's see. Also, let me go over here. Okay, you're going to want to have cookies. Uh, I've got fudge stripes there. i got Ritz crackers here, big case of that. Um, again, for morale, treat foods are going to be important. Uh, if you can make people forget the hell exists outside, and give them any sort of normalcy of what they were used to live in a certain quality of life, that's going to go a long way to keep a morale up. Mental health and morale during a disaster is key. I don't care what show you watch, Naked and Afraid, uh, Alone, or any of the disaster shows, as soon as a person loses the will to live, I don't care how trained they are, how much equipment, how much food they got, when they lose the will to live, it's game over with. So you got to keep that morale up. So you definitely want to have some treat food. 
and then push comes to shove. You have to do some barter trading with someone. I got a big case of uh, romaine noodles here, and I got another one in storage. But those are great to fill, fill bellies with. They don't have very much uh, nutritional value, but just to be able to fill stomachs up. And again, people are used to eating them. You can add stuff to them to give them more nutritional value. But that's something that you definitely want to have. Uh, let's see if I can go up top. Up top, I got a container here, it's a bucket that's filled with nothing but candles, over a year's worth of candles. Candles you can use for heat, eight or ten small tea candles can be used to boil a, uh, a cup of water in a pot. And if you're able to boil water, you're able to boil rice or cook food. Uh, so I've got over, between tea candles and emergency candles, I've got a year's worth of candles in that bucket. Things to catch up. Fruit juice, bags of nuts, again, protein. Uh, I'm a green tea drinker, so I've got green tea. For my uh, vegetables, I've got some dressing. I've got cans of soup. <clears throat> That's onion mix there for uh, cooking meat and giving meat flavor, especially if it's wild meat. But I don't know the see. Let's see here. I got cases of the Denty Moore, Campbell's chicken noodle. And then over on the side, I've, I've got, what is that? Marie Callender's and Healthy Choice. Got a case of the Vienna sausages. And I know people may not like these, but through experimentation, I can tell you, <laughs> put enough barbecue sauce on these. These taste great with barbecue sauce on. Mm -mm. <laughs> I have the uh, Jack Link's jerky because this this has a good shelf life as well that you can put in your food pantry. I also stock tuna fish because it does not have to be refrigerated. And again, if you got salsas or something, you can even put hot sauce on this. Is way the bodybuilders eat it. And, and they eat it just plain straight out of the can. You don't have to uh, put that in no refrigeration. Cans of chicken breasts. I've got some cases of that. This is old classic spam. And I didn't think much of it. Until I went on my honeymoon to Hawaii with my wife that I had at the time. The Hawaiians can make miracles happen with Spam. <laughs> it's in everything. It's in the eggs. It's, it's in uh, chili. I, I remember they even had some sort of sushi that had Spam, rice, fish, and something else on a cracker. And people were buying it up. But they performed miracles with Spam. And again, Spam has a, a super long shelf life. So where people that may not like it, I'm telling you, it could be a good barter item for you in the event you have to barter and trade with someone. And then even, even cans of chili. I mean, you can eat this straight out of a can, or you can put this right over top of a campfire and open the lid. As soon as it heats up, very low energy is needed. You got a complete meal. Let's see. And then on my bottom shelf, I have lemon, so that you can have lemon water, which helps keep your vitamin C up. Vinegar for storing vegetables. Uh, these are, what do you call them, little jalapeno peppers. Mm -hmm. Things are hot sauce. And over on the side, you have to be able to cook, so I've got both Crisco and I have olive oil for cooking. Okay. But those are some of the basic staples that I, that I myself have in my pantry. Uh, and I don't know if I happen to mention ketchup, but got to have some ketchup also. That changes the flavor. Yes. And then after you get your food storage together, and, and don't try to do it overnight. Plan your six-month goal. Just a little bit 
maybe $20, $30 a month. After about six or eight months, when you look back on it, it really adds up. And then with the long-term food that you put back, that backs up your medium level food that's going to last. You'll have food that lasts a year to eight years. And then your long-term food is going to go 10 to 30 years. So if you get into a planting season and start to run low on food, that's when you break out your long-term food. And that should get you through a planting season until that season's over. Then the next thing you should be concerned of is water. Water is key. You're only going to go three days without it. You can go three weeks without food, but you're only going to go three days without water. And with water, you're looking at three, three events that you want to be able to accomplish, three goals. One, the attainability of it. Do you know where it's at and how are you going to get it? So are you going to use solar stills? Or are you going to use rain catchment off your gutters? Do you know where the creeks, rivers, and streams are and ponds and lakes in your area? Or, and if you do, you got to make sure that that water doesn't have gasoline or oil floating in it. And you can touch your hand in the water and smell your hand. You can smell the gas or oil. If it is, you can't use that water. But if it doesn't, now your next go after finding the availability of it is going to be how to purify it. And this is basically... What I'm going to show you here are some methods. Okay. The very first one is called a uh, let's see here, called an aquapod. Okay. On on uh, Amazon they call them water bombs. As you can see, you can see a bathtub. It's a giant bladder that rolls out into the tub and it has a spigot on it. It goes up to your water spout. You turn, put, put it on, hold on to it, turn on the cold water, and it takes about 10, 15 minutes to fill. It turns your bathtub into an emergency 65-gallon uh, water storage container. This will keep the water good for up to two months. It comes with one of these little hand siphon pumps that you can pump the water out with as you need it. And it actually turns your bathtub into something that can be utilized to store water. Along with that, you have to take in consideration your water heater. I don't know if you have a 40 gallon, 60, 80, whatever gallon water heater you got. If it's gas, you have to turn the gas off to it and let that water cool. If it's electric, go to your circuit breaker box, cut that water off. I mean, cut the electricity off to it and you let that water cool. And that will give you an emergency. 40, 60, 80 gallons, depending upon how big your water heat is. Then along with that, if you have in your pantry just plain Clorox, no Febreze, no fresh scent, no, no additives. It has to be just straight Clorox bleach. You can purify water by utilizing two drops to a quart, four drops to a half gallon, eight drops to a gallon, Half a teaspoon if you got a big uh, water cooler that you can put water in, five-gallon water cooler. And if you have a 55-gallon drum, you're going to need five and a half teaspoons of bleach to purify that. If you want to just have backup for your backup, if you have these, you don't need bleach. These are water purification tablets. You put one into a cup, uh, a quart of water. You wait a lot of time. makes the water safe to drink. You don't have that you want to go with something a little bit more fancier so purification tabs would be about 15 bucks you can go what is called a life straw and you literally put this in your mouth you can go down to any river creek or if you got a bucket of water you can even put this down to toilet water as long as it don't have one of those blue things in it and you can drink the water out of it and this will make that water safe to drink it removes the giardia uh, crypto and some of the other stuff that's in the water and the bacteria. Um, these things will do about 260 gallons of water. So this is a great little thing to have. You're talking 20 to $25 for one. You want to go a little fancier? This is a water basics filtration kit, as you can see. These are $85. They, they're a hand pump system. And this is for high risk water. If water has virus in it, bacteria, if the water's polluted, 
This will clean the water. It's good for about 120 gallons. And then you can buy extra filters for it that'll run you $33. And each filter is good for 120 gallons. But if the water's really bad, this is a great system to have. Then if you can afford much more, I don't know if you can see this one. This is a Berkey system. Looks like a giant coffee can. I mean, a coffee maker. A Berkey system is going to run you about 300 and up, depending upon how many gallon it is. I have a three gallon one here. It'll do about three gallons an hour. And it's so good of a system that if water had mercury floating in it or have mercury in it, this would purify mercury out of water. And a single set of filters for it would do 5,000 gallons of water. So, wow. and then I just want you to see also that, I don't know if you can see or not, but I also maintain uh, 12 cases of water. Can you see that, Nadia? Yes, I can see it. Okay. For those of you that prefer to go with already bottled water, bottled water is good for about two years. Cases are, then the bottles themselves begin to degrade. You start, if you hold them up to light, you start to see little plastic floating inside the bottled waters that you don't want in your kidneys. And the bottles themselves, uh, the cases I prefer to go with 32 to maybe 40 size cases. So I buy my water at, at Sam's Club or Costco's. Uh, so if you can get your membership there because it's great for being able to buy things on the cheap uh, in bulk. But keep in mind that a case of bottled water uh, is only going to be good for two years storage life. So you don't want to go beyond that. So I keep 12 cases on hand because for a family of four to six to be able to go 30 days on water, you're going to need 12 to 15 cases. You got that many cases? You can sit in your property, you can shelter in place for at least four to six weeks, and then you'll be able to decide, is it still safe to remain in the property or do you have to go? And then the last thing is going to be in, in dealing with water, is going to be the storage of it. Now, let me turn this around a little bit. Okay. As you can see, Light's kind of bright. I have a 30 gallon container here. These are called water bricks. These are three and a half gallons. This is your standard six gallon water storage container. In the back of it, the little green one back there is just a five gallon water cooler that you'd have at a picnic. Black one up here on top is 15 gallon water storage container. And then if you want to get into the big deals, then these are 55 gallon containers. And as you can see, I installed a spigot on the bottom of one of them because I was going to utilize that one for rain catchment. I was going to put it up on a couple of cinder blocks cut my gutter spout off and then have water going straight into it. Then I can just go out and put a five gallon bucket of water under it and uh, fill it up, bring it in as, as it's needed in case I have to run my uh, toilet or whatever. I'd have access to water. But the thing about the 30 gallon, these big 55 gallon drums, when you fill them up, you're not moving them. Wherever they're at, they're going to be there for a while until they get empty. Water weighs eight pounds, three ounces. And one of these big ones is going to be above 450 pounds. A 30 gallon one's going to be above 20 something pounds. Even a little three and a half gallon is going to be pretty close to 29 pounds when it's full. So water's heavy to move. Once you fill them, you ain't hardly moving them. And outside of that, Oh, one last thing, too. Okay. Going to the uh, 
renewable food source. What I have here is a little photo album. And all I did was I turned the pockets, turned it over the other way so they don't spill out. I turned the pockets into things that I put seeds into, packets of seeds. Okay. This right here is my renewable food source. If I don't want to go with that, I don't have it, I don't have it in here. Uh, I also had a, a seed bank that you, that you can order online if you want to order a seed bank. Those that have about 28 packets of seeds in them, and you can just type in seed bank and they'll pop up on, online. And you can uh, have your, a means to be able to grow food for the following season in the event of disaster lasts a whole long period of time. You've got to have the means to create a renewable food source. But outside of that, setting up your food again, you've got to have food that's going to be easy to prepare, very, require very little energy. You want to have food that can go anywhere from your perishables, which is so many days. Then you get into <clears throat> medium, which is a year to 10 years. And then long term is 10 to 30 years. And then okay. your renewable food source. You set that up, you should be fine. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. one last thing. One last thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, again, on food, on water storage, you want to get you a few packs of this. This is Aquamara water treatment. You pour those into your drums, let the uh, chemical reaction occur, and then pour your water in. This keeps your water good for five years. So if you're storing water long term, you can't beat this little kit. You're only talking about 20 bucks, and that water stays good for five years. Okay. That's it, Nadia. I'm okay. sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for... Okay informing us on how to go about storing and things like that. Now, there are some other um, actual methods that you can use, such as canning. And I, I never want to do a class on canning because if you do it wrong, you can cause uh, the growth of botulism in that product. And uh, botulism is, it can be fatal. And that's one of those class A diseases that I always talk about when I'm in, uh, you know, disease investigator mode. Um, but yes, you do not want to, if you, if you want to learn canning, I would suggest that you contact your local, local extension office and they have classes that actually teach you how to can in person. Um, because if you have the, the uh, pH wrong, what will happen is microorganisms can grow in there and they can make you sick. And it's not just even botulism. There's, there's different type of fungi like aspergillus and things like that, that you do not want growing in your food that you can and then you eat it because it can make you very sick. Um, it can make your family very sick and it can actually kill you. So um, canning is one thing. Uh, and then Kyra is going to talk about, um, you know, dehydration and things like that in a moment. But it's very important that if you're going to go about, um, you know, storing things that you prepare in your home from your things from your garden or, you know, meat and things like that, that you do it properly so that you not, you know, create another problem in your household. Also, uh, it's very important that you store the stuff in, in those containers. You know, I haven't talked about the, the, the rat and mice, mouse problem that we're experiencing right now, but that's another issue is pests. Um, they will actually invade, they can actually invade your products. So, you know, we're having a serious issue right now with rats and mice because of COVID-19 and all these facilities being shut down and things like that, that um, rodent populations have gotten out of control. And not only do rodents carry diseases, they come in and they destroy things. They'll, 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 if they find your, your food stash, they will go rummage right through it. They'll use the bathroom through it. They'll, you know, they'll eat it all up and then you won't be able to use it. So make sure you have your things stored. Uh, make sure you have it on shelves off the floor. That's one way of preventing them from getting to it, even though they can climb. Um, but having it in, you know, sealed containers will help you. There's also insects that will invade. And I talked about that in one of my uh, YouTube lives about store grain pests. Uh, things like flour and stuff, when you get it, if you put it in the freezer for about a week and let the freezer kill any eggs and things that might be present in there, that will actually prolong 
your uh your life even once you store it um putting those packs in there like he was telling you uh that will actually dehydrate it and that will keep the eggs that may not have died if you don't freeze it it'll keep those eggs from being able to hatch and you know having those insects in there inf infesting your your flower and all types of other grains and things you have uh so just keep that in mind you know i'm always looking at the animal aspect of stuff because it can be uh that can be a problem um, also, make sure the food is closed up uh, because, you know, any animal, not just, you know, rodents, your pets, if they smell it, they can go and rummage through it as well. So just make sure that you have stuff stored up so that there's no, no, any animals invading it. So now Kyra, she's going to discuss with us how to go about preparing meals, especially during, you know, a crisis situation or, you know, just to have where you can make your food stretch. So Kyra, go ahead. <laughs> what to store it's very important to know how to make it taste good and so I really appreciate the information that Aaron shared with us this evening and I'm going to definitely build upon that foundation one of the things that's very important when we take into consideration food preparation and storage is our caloric intake a normal diet consists of 2,000 calories consumed per day if you are an adult between the ages of 18 to 25. However, if you are a child or younger, that increases. And so it's very important to take into consideration when you're in a time of crisis, you may or may not be able to have that 2000 calories. So you want to make sure that you're cooking nutrient dense foods that are going to be very delicious, tasty, as well as nutritious. And so a few of the things that I wanna talk about especially just to share and broaden our perspective, our beans, rice, and how to make those things flavorful. Also something that's very important when you're looking at food storage and the life of the food that you're preparing for your family is salt and sugar content. A lot of the meals that you're going to have to use, especially in preparation, are going to be very high in salt and sugar. So one of those ways that we combat that is by adding in fresh produce, things of that nature. So I'm gonna show you a few items that we have right here. This is an organic can of beans. It's in a BPA free can. If you have the capability, it's so important in storing your food to do a rotation process. And when you do a rotation process, if you have BPA free cans, it does not have the phthalates that are contained in normal cans. And it's a more healthy way for you to have food that's palatable and storable. I have some Rosarita beans. I know that Aaron touched on that in his presentation. Beans are considered a valuable source of protein. If you are someone that has practiced a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle and in or during these trying times, you have to transition into possibly consuming meat refried beans and the black beans that I had showed previously are good sources of protein so that if you don't want to consume meat, these are some really good high caloric nutrient dense foods that you can have in your pantry to prepare healthy, nutritious meals for you and your family. One thing that I'd like to point out is when we're storing our food and making sure that we're eating healthy and eating properly on the back of any product that you have, you're going to have a label. And that label is your guide to showing you the salt, sugar content, daily values. It will be shown with a D and a V and a sign showing you exactly how many calories, how many sugars, potassium, anything that's necessary for the vital support of your body. So it's very important that you read the nutrition label and make sure that the foods that you're choosing to store are the most nutritious and healthy for you and your family. And one way that you can use refried beans in a very delicious way, I know that Aaron talked about the importance of food shelf and life. Using a can of beans and having tortilla chips, things of that nature, that's very healthy. And then in addition to that, let me tilt my camera so you can see the pantry here. Having bags of chips, things of this nature, crackers are very important because you can take a can of beans, mix it with some of your 
other items and make things stretch. And it's so important that when you're dealing with a crisis or a difficult situation that you're washing portion control. And so let me show you what that looks like. I like to use measuring cups because they're very helpful. It's a good visual. And so you have one fourth cup, one third, one half and one cup. Make sure you all can see that. Can you see it good? Okay, good. And so when preparing your meals for your family, you want the majority of your plate to consist of fruits and vegetables. And then you wanna have a smaller portion about the size of your hand of protein. Again, it's very important to remember that during these crisis times, you are going to have to be very mindful of what you consume and how you prepare it. And so using portions, especially with foods that are higher in salt and sugar, being mindful of how much you give to each person. And then for those individuals who perhaps are diabetic or have challenges with salt or high blood pressure, you want to augment again with fresh foods and fruits and vegetables and then possibly utilizing a dehydrator because this will help you in a long way. Aaron talked about food storage as far as sealing, the dehydrator removes moisture. So that gives the food an opportunity to last longer as well as making sure that the microbiota and microorganisms are not proliferating through the food that you're going to store. Let me show you what that looks like. So I have a Nesco food dehydrator. It comes with your attachment where you can fan out, then you cut your vegetables, whether it be strawberries, which would be a delicious, healthy snack. Also apples, carrots, things of that nature. And you take those, put them, wash and clean, slice them very thinly and then you place them on the dehydrator following the instructions per, per the unit. And then you can take those, put those in Mylar bags, and in critical situations, you can put them in Ziploc bags, portion them out. And again, portion is very critical because in these types of situations, you wanna make sure that you have enough food to last for the duration of the time that you may be in isolation or not able to go to the grocery store. Another staple that I want to share with you, and Aaron touched on it before, rice. Rice is extremely healthy, and it's a good way to bulk up your meals. This particular packet of long grain brown rice has the endosperm on it. So again, the shelf life is a little less than white rice, but you would seal it the same way. But this type of rice is excellent. Open the can of tomatoes. Pour over your rice and have a can of tuna. You've got a healthy, nutritious meal. You have protein, you have your starches, and those are things that you want. You want the building blocks of healthy nutrition when you're preparing the meals for your family. Again, measuring spoons are very helpful. When you're measuring out some of the portions for your meals, especially if you have spices, and I'll get into that in a few moments, your spices are going to take the ordinary beans, rice, and spaghetti and pasta and turn it into, hi baby girl, into a phenomenal meal. And you wanna, again, in crisis situations, you wanna take into consideration that people are going to be very frustrated, discouraged, and sad. So the food that you cook you want to infuse it with soul. You want to infuse it with life, longev longevity, and a feeling of warmth and happiness. And so some of the herbs that I would encourage you to use in your food are ginger. Ginger is a warming herb. It's excellent for gastrointestinal discomfort. We've got a little bit of cayenne pepper. For those of us who like spice, things that heat your body up and keep you warm and keep your metabolism going really well. Also, as a caveat, cayenne can be used in severe cases for cauterization. So if someone is cut or unfortunately shot, you can take this 
and use it in the wound to pack it to keep it from bleeding out. So this is a good herb to have on hand and spice to help in those types of situations. Again, fennel. Fennel is delicious. You can use this prepared as a tea. Also to give flavorings to your food. Fennel also helps with upset stomach. A lot of times when we talk about food preparation, we don't actually go in to the situation of not feeling well. In crisis situations, we're stressed, we're overwhelmed, we're not feeling our best. So sometimes you might have an upset stomach. Fennel is excellent to help with the easing of the stomach and helping you to feel good in your digestive tract, okay? Sea salt, I got this from Kroger the other day. Buy one, get one free. I love sea salt. I also like pink Himalayan sea salt. This is an excellent salt to use if you want to be very mindful of blood pressure and things of that nature. Iodized table salt is very, very difficult for someone to consume. And so I definitely encourage you to use this. And this is where having your measuring spoon is important. Again, we want to look at the labeling, the nutritional label, and follow those instructions as much as possible. If it says one teaspoon is worth 35 milligrams or 25 milligrams of salt per can or per tablespoon or unit, you want to follow that, especially if you are someone that is dealing with diabetes, high blood pressure, and some of the maladies that affect our health. And in those types of situations, Again, you want to be very mindful of what you're consuming and how you prepare your foods, but still enjoy a tasty meal. One of the things that I like to have on hand is Jiffy corn mix. This is very versatile. You can take this, follow the instructions, but to make it more nutritious and more delicious for your family, add some raisins, add a little bit of pumpkin spice, add a little bit of oregano, and you've got a delicious new flavor bread. Try as much as possible to boost the nutritional value of whatever you have in your packaged items. This is one of my favorite books. It's called The Flavor Bible and featured in here are many useful ways of using herbs and how to add them to your meals. During a crisis situation, it's so important to know what to use for what food that you have. So if you're going to have baked beans, what would go well with baked beans? You can cut up some onions, dehydrated onion pellets. Those are good to help the body heal. Also using garlic, that is excellent as a spice and it's antimicrobial and antiviral. So you want your food to heal your body. You want your body to work synergistically with what you have in your pantry. And another thing that I'd like to showcase one second, and Aaron touched on it a few minutes ago, was your pastas and things of that nature. Yes, she loves my cooking. One moment. <laughs> Barilla spaghetti. You can take these. And again, you want to follow the nutrition facts on the back of the box. And it says eight servings per container. So if there's a family of four, you're going to split that out into four equal portions. Sometimes you might want to, again, when you have large family gatherings, increase that and then portion that out. But again, in the event that things, lights go out and you don't have the connectivity to electricity, only open one box and then you would take a can of your tuna or perhaps maybe some beans. And I used to, when I first was married and my husband and I, when we went on our honeymoon, we took a vacation and they gave us Texas spaghetti. And so we had noodles, beans, and then we had a little bit of salsa and it was delicious. And so those are things that you want to take into consideration in your food preparation and your food storage. Nutrition is very important. The nutritional value of your food is very, very key. And you want it to taste good. And it's important to increase 
the nutrient dense foods and have it taste healthy too. All right, thank you, Kyra. You're welcome. So, so does anybody have any questions? Has anybody on here, do they have their own um, food storage? Have they been canning? Have they been preparing? I mean, you know, this was kind of thrown on us recently with the COVID-19. Um, it should have been something that we all should have been preparing for a while ago. But, um, you know, no time is better than the present to get started. So has anyone started storing or started, you know, prepping, setting up food? I know uh, Aaron, he had came on a few weeks ago and he had talked about um, – the things you need for a uh, bug out bag. And he told us like some of the things that you pack and things like that and have readily available if you have to leave. Um, but yes, storing this food, you know, say you don't have to leave, but something happens where you have to stay, you know, shelter in. I'm pretty sure they're going to have a shelter in again sooner or later uh, with these COVID-19 cases. I, I, I keep saying all these articles, some articles say they're going back up. Other ones say they're going down. I guess it totally depends on what state you're in and, and whatever, you know, agendas they're trying to push, but um, that we might have to shelter back in place or, you know, I don't know how the school systems are going to operate come fall. Um, so a lot of children are going to be home and parents are going to have to, you know, prepare meals now. They didn't have to use to prepare because they would get them at school. Um, so knowing how to ration and, you know, having food readily available will help with that whole situation. Uh, Miss Ebony said she came in late, uh, so I'm not sure if it was addressed. Do expiration dates matter on canned goods? How much longer after they expire are they edible? You want to touch on that, Aaron? Yeah, that's going to depend upon on what it is. Again, fruit is going to expire faster than vegetables and canned meat will. Um uh, I say you could probably you probably be pretty safe within four to six months beyond the expiration date. And certain foods, if they're nitrogen packed, can actually go almost ten years if it's a canned good item. But usually, it, those items cost a little bit more money. And also, I'd like to add that I forgot to mention earlier that again, if you're going to do baking under a, a situation, you're going to need powdered milk. And right now, even that's getting hard to find. So if you're going to have cereal, do any baking or anything that needs milk as an additive or just to uh, put milk on your cereal, after the milk in your refrigerator gets used up or expires and it's no good, powdered milk is going to be the only option that you're going to have at that point. So that's something that has an extreme long shelf life and it should be a part of your preps. Also, any product that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, toilet paper, uh, say uh, soap, bars of soap, toothpaste, mouthwash. I mean, if you want to have it in the future and you look on the label and it's made outside of this country, you better be stocking it. Because as we get deeper into the next few months, it's going to become more and more apparent what we don't manufacture here. Like right now in my area, uh, the grocery store called Myers had to uh, put out a warning uh, sign. Larry, by I know there's a 10 tin and aluminum can shortage and that some of the prop products that come in aluminum cans may not be around much longer or they may get some in and have to wait a long time to get some more and I'm pretty sure that if there's any beer that comes in those type cans uh, you may start seeing shortages on that so if it's made outside this country it's best for you to stock it if you want to have it down the road Okay. Uh, one thing with the cans. Okay, um, one thing with the cans, though, is if if the can is swollen, or if you, you notice any type of damage on that can, oh. you're gonna want to not to use whatever's in there. Uh, the simple fact is, if it's swollen, that means microorganisms are in there, and they're exchanging gases, and that's what it's causing to swell. So you don't want to eat that. But also, if it got punctured somehow, or you know damage where the, the like the lid or something is busted 
you just want to get rid of that to make sure that you do not uh, expose yourself to any microorganisms that could actually make you sick. So that's the last thing you want to have to do is, you know, eat something and you have to go to the hospital if you can even make it to the hospital. Um, botulism, it sets in very quickly. Um, and I don't know if anybody have ever heard about botulism poisoning, but uh, what happens is it, it, it totally causes rigor of your muscles and things like that. Um, it can stop your heart a lot of other bad things. So you do not want to eat anything that may have, um, you know, been in a can and the can is swollen or busted or whatever. Also, when you open something up, if it just doesn't smell right, even though it might not have exceeded the expiration date, but it just smells weird, like sour or it just smells rotten, or you actually see microorganisms like mold or something on it, even though it may not have exceeded that expiration date, do not consume that. Um, because again, you'll be consuming, you know, microorganisms that could possibly make you very sick or even kill you. So, um, yeah, just don't do that. Um, Kairos, you wanted to actually talk about something else, uh, tea as well as vitamins. So we're going to let her talk about that. And then we, I see some more comments over here. and We'll get to those in one second. Okay, great. One of the things that I think is very essential when we're talking about food preparation and nutritious, healthy meals are teas and vitamins. I know that we talked earlier about beans and rice and pasta. And those things are very, very important. But you want to have something to add nutritional value to your water as well. Our bodies are comprised of 70% water. And like Aaron had shared with us earlier, you can go three to four days without eating, but not that long without water. So after you sanitized and boiled and made your water potable, you want to add a nutritional aspect to that. So let me show you some teas that would be very helpful for you in your food preparation storage plan. Okay. I've angled the camera so you can see a little bit. So just give me a moment. Okay. Okay. I'm going to show you a few of the cans the, of the boxes that I had. And again, these are excellent for healing and keeping the body in its optimal state during crisis times. Sarsaparilla tea is phenomenal. It helps the upper respiratory. Mm. It helps with phlegm. Making sure that you can cough is also used as an expectorant. So this is excellent. And you can take it out of the box. Put in a hot cup of water and brew it. And you're going to, again, increase that nutritional value tenfold. Mm. Mm. I've got a peppermint delight probiotic. Traditional medicinals is an excellent tea that I use for myself and my family. Peppermint also mm. is very calming for the stomach. It helps with flatulence. If you're eating a lot of beans, mm. you're going to have that challenge. But peppermint helps to calm the stomach. And it's also a stimulant in the fact that it helps you to concentrate, helps you to focus. So if you need something to, to drink after you've had your beans or maybe you started with a diet that you're not used to during these difficult times, peppermint is phenomenal. It's also known as a carminative. Chamomile is considered a nervine. I know it's a little difficult to see, maybe if I tilt it that way. And nervines are very helpful because they're adaptive. And during stressful times, I remember the old folks saying, my nerves is bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> my nerves is bad. So <laughs> with difficult times, Chamomile is an excellent way to give you that calm, that peaceful state to be able to handle the challenges that you're facing. This is also helpful if someone has a rash or an issue with their skin. This can also be applied topically to the skin. You would just simply brew this as you would your regular cup of tea, pour it on a cloth, make a poultice, or also get a peri wash bottle and just spray it on the skin topically for stings rashes and things of that no nature, chamomile. Mm. Let's make sure this doesn't fall. Mm. And then I know we've also talked about making sure that we're healthy. I have a bottle of hair, skin and nails from Vitafusion. You can make sure that the comp company is reputable, that they use mm. quality processing mm. modalities when they're creating 
vitamins for your family. And again, it's important with the decrease in the mm -hmm. content, the 2000 caloric value, mm -hmm. you're going to want to have some vitamins. And so let me read to you what we have here. My apologies, just a second. Sorry about that. We have total carbs, eight grams, sugars, seven. And this is a really good, and it's a multivitamin and it works with hair, skin, and nails. And then right here, I have a tea strainer. You can put fresh herbs, and let me show you what that looks like. One moment. <clears throat> you can take your fennel, you're going to open up your tea seed, your tea ball, and what this is, it helps to extract. If you like to take your fresh herbs and dry them yourselves, you can take a little bit of the fennel, pour it into the tea container, the tea ball. Put this in some hot water, let it steep for five to 10 minutes. Again, an excellent way to increase your nutrients in your water. And also if the water is a little tepid and it doesn't taste the way that you like, this increases the flavor and it makes it more palatable for younger children and maybe also for the elderly. So these are just a few things that I wanted to share because a lot of times we focus on the broader spectrum, but I wanna just bring it in and streamline it a little bit more. So we're looking at a looking at it from a holistic perspective. So you've got your foods, you've got your things that you're going to heal and nourish your body. And fennel also is excellent for the for nails, teeth and hair as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. So um, we have a few comments over here. Kay Jr. said, greetings panel and chat. I am enjoying the content. Well, thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Ethan Coffee said, uh, I have been using Bucket System for a few months. Now works great. Have any of you tried the one, two, three bread? Has anybody tried that? I can tell you what it is, Nadia. Okay. It's, it's a way of making homemade bread. The, the one is a can of beer. Two is two cups of flour. And three is three tablespoons of sugar. You mix that together, you put it in a greased uh, bread pan, basically, put it in the oven, and it, it makes homemade bread. It's a real simple form of making homemade bread. Okay. It's called one, two, three bread. Have you tried it before? Yeah. <laughs> How's it taste? <laughs> it, it tastes good. It tastes good. And, okay. and, and if at the end, you can, uh, a, as it comes out, you can actually put um, garlic butter over the top of it stuff, and it, it actually tastes pretty good. Okay, I have to we have to do that on a, a live, I guess, showing how to mix that up, see how that tastes. <laughs> but I, I do want to reiterate what something that you said earlier. I mean, the enemies of food is sunlight, moisture, air, insects, and rodents. Uh, the method that I showed using the mylar bags, they they keep the smell in, so you don't have to worry about insects and rodents smelling it, and then putting them inside the bucket. With the uh, gamma seal, lids. again, that's an airtight seal. If an insect or animal can't smell it, they're not going to tunnel through something to get to it. So, again, it, it keeps your food very well kept. All right. And if I could add to that, when you have your store cans, the ones that are not being stored in the containers, let me show you what I'm talking about. Your cans just in case the rodents or the animals do get to it or defecate on top of it, you wanna take a wet washcloth and wipe on the outer side before you open it up. So that way when you open it up, you're not exposing it to microorganisms or bacteria. A lot of times people just go, let me just go grab a can of soda and drink. You don't know right. what's been on top of that. <laughs> you right. don't know what you're ingesting. So <laughs> you don't yeah. know what you're drinking. Okay, so we want to wipe that off very simply with a wet rag, wipe it off, and then open it up. One quick item. In the event that electricity goes out, let me see if I can find it. Can opener. You want to have a can opener that you can open that's not electric. 
that's very important because in situations like that, you want to have the ability to open up your food. If you have a lot of canned goods and you can't get into it, that's not good. So, okay. You want to make sure that you have that can opener and always be prepared in whatever situation that you find yourself in. Oh, one other thing. Since my baby girl grabbed my water, I'm going to make this moment a magical one. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it out. These are vitamin C packets. And again, when we're talking about taking our bottled water and all of the things that we have in food storage and giving it that, that nutritional boost that it needs, these are vitamin C packets. And in one serving, 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C includes seven B vitamins, antioxidants, and electrolytes. So it's very important that during these crisis times, you're keeping yourself hydrated. Hydration will make you very ill and it can also increase blood pressure as well as make it very difficult for you to process your food. One thing that we don't always like to talk about is defecation. And if you're adding in new foods to your diet, <laughs> yes, baby girl, if you're adding new foods into your diet, your stomach has to process that. So you wanna again, increase your vitamin absorption. You wanna increase the bioflavonoids within your food and vitamin C packets, you just take one, open it, pour it into a bottle of water, drink, shake, drink, and you're ready to go. So I'm glad that she grabbed the water. You take what you have and you work with it and you use these vitamin C packets. Thank you. You're one thing welcome. we didn't touch on was we didn't really talk about freezing uh, products. Oh. Okay. Um, but yes, so if you're growing things out in your garden or, you know, if you have meat and things, a deep freezer may be something that you want to invest in if you have the space for it, um, because you can, you know, store things in the freezer for a long period of time if you have it in the proper types of containers. Um, that's how I usually, when I have surplus from my uh, urban farm, what I do is I'll freeze things. And I say I get nervous with the whole canning. Um you know, I, I, I work in, 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 you know, public health, being a disease investigator. I've seen people that experience botulism as well as, you know, some other uh, uh, microorganism poisonings because they didn't do canning properly. Um, but you can freeze things, um, things like fruits and vegetables. If you cut them up, store them in containers, they freeze very well. Meat freezes very well. Um you can even prepare meals and freeze the meals and just have them ready to be heated up. Um, so that's another option if you don't want to go the canning route or, you know, the dehydration route. You can always freeze things as well. The only thing with the freezer is, you know, if there's a power outage, uh, then you're on a countdown of, you know, if, if the outage is going to be for an extended period of time, that stuff may go bad in there. Um, so maybe having a generator or some type of backup electricity so solar or something that will run that particular item maybe of use to maybe something that you want to invest in is maybe like, you know, some solar panels or figuring out how to set those up uh, and having that, you know, has turned on if there's ever a power outage so that your things in the deep freezer can still stay frozen. Um, so that was just one more thing I wanted to add on to there. Um, we have a few more comments. Uh, Renaissance Risk says, Sarsaparilla has lots of iron too. I use it every day. And then Miss Ebony said, yes, I always wash the cans off. Yes, that's, I mean, that's what anything, even wash off your produce. Even if you grow it outside you, and you come in, you need to wash it off. Um, there's all types of things that your, uh, if you have a garden or farm or whatever, I always see people that they'll take a tomato right off the vine and just pop it in their mouth. and be like, mm, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's all types of stuff that at night that touches over things, you know, there's insects, there's animals, there's people that might be roaming through there. I mean, all types of things that can leave microorganisms that can cause you to get sick. So just if you're growing your own stuff, it's always wise to go and wash it. Even if you're growing it indoors, just make it mindful that, you know, you know, it could have been a fly or something came in and landed on it. Uh, and you just want to wash that off because they can too can, can transmit uh, microorganisms. Um, and if so, I can add, oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Nadia. That's okay. If I can add a quick veggie wash 
one tablespoon of baking soda, one tablespoon of apple cider or white vinegar, put it in a quart of water. You can immerse your vegetables, rinse in the water, and then you can clean it. For things like potatoes and oranges, things that have an outer shell, you're gonna wanna get yourself a vegetable brush and yep. scrub the outer surface. Because again, remember the outer surface is very porous. So it goes through a chain of supply. You know, you don't know how many hands it's passed through. So it's always important just to take that extra step to protect yourself and clean it, pro clean it properly. One other thing that I wanted to show really quick that I was really excited about just a second. Okay. Same thing with you're having, if you have, um, uh watermelons, cantaloupes, and things like that. You want to make sure you clean off the outside before you actually go and cut it into it because what you'll do is you'll actually introduce microorganisms into the part that you're going to feed on. Um, so you want to make sure that you are cleaning cleaning the surface. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. This is important as far as people that if they're concerned about protein, make sure you can see the label. <clears throat> we have some spicy nuts and raisins a really quick nutritious snack to make for your children as well as your entire family. You're going to want to get a Ziploc bag. And again, portion control is very key because in critical times, if you're not able to go to the store or if there's inclement weather, you're going to take your, your nuts and your raisins. You're going to portion out one fourth cup each of your nuts and your raisins poured into a bag. You're going to want to add some cinnamon. Cinnamon is a very delicious spice. It tastes wonderful mixed in, and you're going to add that in, shake it up in a bag. Ziploc bags have three or four of those. So when your children wake up in the morning, or if you're in a place where you're staying in, you can portion meals out. In a situation that's difficult and challenging, you want to have things pre-packaged and pre-prepared so you don't have to fumble and worry. Because if you're anxious or you're frustrated, you might eat a little bit more. And something that we also want to take into consideration is our mental health and comfort foods. You'd be surprised if you're stressed or you're overwhelmed. You can go through a can of peanuts very quickly. But if you have them portioned out prior to the difficulties, you can give everyone what they need and make sure that things balance. I'm very, I'm a strong proponent of having healthy, nutritious foods, a part of your diet so that you can live, live healthy and be able to face the stressors that come into your life. So again, just your standard Kroger peanuts, whatever flavor you like, your raisins. And again, to make sure that you're giving your family and yourself that 2000 caloric diet, if at all possible, you want to read on the back of there and see how many per serving and the daily value, the nutritional value. Okay. Also, one more thing we didn't talk about was actually if you have pets, make sure you store away some food for them as well. Um, so if there's ever a time where you can't go and pick up their food, um, you'll have some stored. My dog, she actually eats people food. So... <laughs> we be preparing meals for her with our meals. But, you know, if your pet eats dry food or, you know, if they eat cans and things, make sure you have uh, a stockpile of that as well, uh, just so you will have something to feed them. Go ahead. These are excellent. I know Erin had talked about prepackaged breads and flour. These are excellent. If you can see them, they're called Martha White Blueberry Cheese Muffin Mix. All you need to add is the milk. But again, because I'm very much a health conscious individual, add extra spices, cinnamon, coriander, cardamom. They're all going to give your prepackaged foods a healthy nutritional boost. Herbs are very important for the healing of the body. And so if you have prepackaged foods, because they're going to be higher in salt and sugar, you want to balance that out. So you're going to add in your healthy herbs and spices to create a well-rounded meal for you and your family. And these are pretty good too. Oh, this is apple cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of dairy, um, you know, you can also make, I, they call them like almond milk and stuff. They do have powdered versions of that. Uh, if you don't want to oh. actually consume dairy, um, you can also take almonds and other nuts and, you know, using a food processor, uh, grind them down and then mix them with water and then strain them and then you can make milks from those as well. Yes. 
Uh, if you if you cannot consume, you know, dairy products or, you know, if you're vegan or vegetarian, you do not wish to consume those things. Um, so there's there's a lot of options out there. Um, just just, you know, just just start thinking about getting those things and having them stored up. So if something ever happens, you'll have them readily available and you don't have to figure out, you know, like in the middle of a crisis. Well, how am I going to eat my cereal? I don't have any milk. You already have that stuff stored up or what, what am I going to drink today? You should have it already uh ready uh in your storage so um oh, i'm glad that you mentioned that you know what's an excellent replacer for eggs what? i know a lot of people use it chia seeds let me show you okay and we had uh one question over here um lynn wanted to know will this video be available for playback yes it will be um for some reason after these lives i have if they're over an hour it takes YouTube at least 12 hours to post them uh, onto the onto my uh, uh, channel. So it probably won't show up tomorrow until after whenever we end this broadcast. So if it's like 8 30, 9 o'clock, um, it probably won't show up until 9 o'clock in the morning uh, tomorrow. Um, but yes, it will be on here. If you have the link, it you can watch it from the link. It just won't show up on my page. So um, you can use that link that you you use to actually watch it it's just that it won't show up on there for 12 hours from now um so just know that and then we have another comment before you go and explain about the chia seeds uh ali said high cal calorie foods real important calorie density uh Absolutely. yes calories are very important especially under stressful situations um Absolutely. first thing you want to do is start losing weight and then you can't you can't <laughs> maintain it um you know, some people might want to lose some weight, but then some people, you, you lose too much, you, that, that can be some problems, especially on your heart and things like that. So you want to make sure that uh, you're keeping a high caloric intake uh, so that you don't cause any other health issues. Okay, go ahead. Yes, and, and as I had stated, not... oh. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Aaron, go ahead, did you want to go first? Okay. Um, well, now uh, on the water, I wanted to address something regarding the water. If okay. you ever have to purify water out of a lake or stream and you start to drink and it tastes a little brackish or it has a flavor to it that you don't like, have some beverage powder mixes on hand. I like to stock Tang, again, for electrolytes and vitamin C, but Tang will change that flavor. Uh, Country Time Lemonade, any sort of powder beverage drink mix to make that water more palatable where you drink it. And then going to what Kyra said about the nuts, something that I like to do that's supposed to be healthy for your body. So I like to coat my nuts with honey and cinnamon mix. There's something about what honey and cinnamon does together is supposed to be good for your body. And if you've ever been to a country fair or somewhere, or somebody was cooking nuts that had honey and cinnamon on it, you could smile, you could smell it blocks away. I mean, it, it draws you to the stand. Mm -hmm. And then there was one other one I wanted to mention. Six of the water, the nuts. Uh, I, I can't think of it right now. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, I know what it was. I know what it was. I know. Okay. Go ahead. In the event that you run out of, uh, and this is an item that has a long shelf life that you should stock, and that would be popcorn. I was just uh, thinking and, that. And if you have a food grinder or something that you can grind food corn with, meal. in the event that you run out of cornmeal, you can actually grind, grind popcorn up and use it for cornmeal. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very effective for work. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, oh, my bad. What I was sharing about for vegans and vegetarians, I know that there are a lot of people that don't want to consume animal proteins and things of that nature. So flaxseed, I thought that I had some in my cabinet, but I don't, but I'll share with you the beautiful things about chia seeds. They are very nutrient dense. They're a good source of fiber. And again, when you're picking your grains, make sure that you're getting quinoa, you're getting millet, you're getting those hearty, nutrient-dense grains. I can't stress that enough because, again, you want to make sure that during these times that you are having active bowel movements. And so having something that says 100% wheat, quinoa is a very good, it's an ancient grain. Make sure you take the time to look up what an ancient grain is spelt. We also have to take into consideration individuals that have gluten intolerance. Spelt is excellent for those individuals. And if you are a person that is highly allergic to nuts or nut 
products, you might want to consider not using sesame oil and things of that nature or nuts. You might maybe want to get some Oh, bulgur. Bulgur is excellent as well. It can be turned into a porridge. Add a little bit of hot water, like Aaron said, some cinnamon and honey. You've got a delicious meal. Oatmeal is phenomenal. You can take your instant oatmeal or whole grain, whole wheat oatmeal, prepare it according to the guide, and then add your delicious dried fruits. That's another thing, dried fruits, apricots, raisins, cranberries, add those to your breads, add those to your mixes to make them more nutrient dense. Again, your caloric intake is going to be very, very important to be reminded of and nutrient dense foods. Sugars, again, are empty carbohydrates. They'll give you energy, but they're going to dissipate quickly. So having apricots, dried apricots, papayas, a papaya is excellent for the digestive enzymes. Those are things that are going to be helpful for you as well. So making sure that you have dried fruits is very important as well. Could I add something to what she just said? Yes. <laughs> okay. Going back to the, to the oatmeal, there, there's no finer grain on this earth. I mean, it lowers blood pressure. It lowers cholesterol. Uh, it gives lasting energy, energy. It has antioxidants in it. Um, it's just a very hearty meal. I mean, that's the reason why I stock it in, in my buckets as well as have it out for me to use. I realize a lot of people don't like oatmeal, but uh, there's no greater lasting energy thing. It, it gives you the long burn energy throughout the day. It just doesn't hit you with an energy, and then two hours later, you're dropping like a rock. It, and it's, it's low glycemic. On the earth. Absolutely. Low glycemic. It's very delicious. And again, for those who have issues with diabetes, we also want to take in consider, consideration, excuse me, how much sugar you're consuming. So again, having fruits and vegetables that are low in sucrose and fructose is very, very important. And if you are diabetic, you're going to want to take those portion sizes and cut them in half, if not omit them at all. And unfortunately, that might be challenging. But again, during crisis times, if you do not have enough insulin on hand, you don't want to have your body go into diabetic shock. That is also a very difficult thing and you don't want to you don't want to experience that. So we just want to make sure that we address things from a holistic perspective. Another thing that I wanted to share and I didn't have it all. Thank you for cleaning up, honey, is colloidal silver that can be added to your water as well to help kill any other microbiome microbioorganisms that might be in the water, Giardia and things of that nature. So having some colloidal silver is helpful to all. Oh, thank you, baby. <laughs> and I, I want to add to that the reason why I showed the foods and things I showed today again they require very little energy to cook and prepare maybe just boiling water you have to have the means to be able to cook I want most people to disaster preparedness together to anticipate that technology is going to be done that's the worst case scenario so if your stove is down and you cannot cook on it Whatever means do you have to be able to prepare food? Do you have a grill? Do you have a camping stove? Whatever means do you have and stock the po proper power cells or bags of charcoal or things that you're going to need for that. But definitely plan on the grid being down. If it's not down, then that's just more for you. But if it's down, have the ability to be able to prepare your food. Okay, Nadi. All right. They, uh, Kyra has one more thing to say. One quick thing, as we're serenaded by my daughter in the background, you can make a hobo stove. So say, for instance, you use your Rosarita. After you've used it, you can take off the can. You want to get a, yourself a little tea light candle, put it underneath here, and you've got yourself a portable stove. <laughs> I remember that from outdoor school. So if all else fails and the electricity is Poof, gone. You get that can. You get that little tea light. Put it up underneath there. It's going to heat that surface. You can at least have a cup of tea or some coffee. Add a little bit of ginger to it. You got to use what you got to use what you have. So this yeah. is about being quick on your feet, outwitting and outlasting. And so, just wanted to share that too. It just came back to me. Thank you, right. baby. <laughs> so Renaissance Rich says, "Thank you so much." 
Mulani Mulani said, thank you all for giving us these golden survival tactics. Renaissance Risk said, what about hemp seeds? Oh, yes. Hemp seeds are very, very good. You can use those in salads. You can add them to um, tabbouli. You can use them in different cold preparations. And I wanted to add as a caveat, when you're cooking your spaghetti, say for instance, you don't consume all of it in that one day, you can have it stored in your refrigerator and, and keep it cold. You can add olives. You can add a little bit of vinaigrette. Vinegar is an excellent way to stabilize and keep food from spoiling. Add a little bit of dill, a little bit of cumin. You've got a delicious cold salad. Again, remember, we're in situations where we're in a crisis. And so if refrigeration goes out, you can have that as a cold prepared meal. And I like to use this pasta. This rotini barilla. This is plain, but it also comes in a garden variety. It has eight servings per container. A serving size would be two ounces and it's 200 calories. So you can feed a family of four at least two meals if you're conservative, add those extra things to it, and you're going to have a delicious pasta. And these are very, very good to have on hand. Honey, don't, don't do that, baby. All right, thank you for that. Um, Ali said uh, protein, starch, and fiber is one of the super ancient grains. Uh, Ali also yeah. said Bogar is 15% of, hit of my emergency food <laughs> supply. Yes. Ali said dried fruit are essential, but I still haven't added them as I should have. And then uh um hold on. Sorry, I skipped ahead. Uh K K Jr. asked a question. He wants to uh wants to know how do you maintain balance with the prepping, for example, so it won't turn into hoarding any tips? I have a tip if I can share one. Go ahead. Okay, what I try to do when I go to the grocery store is if I'm gonna get four cans of tomatoes, I get two when I set it aside. That way you're preparing for what might be coming. You're not hoarding, but you're always thinking one step ahead. If you're gonna get tuna fish, get three to save and then get one or two to store. So that way over time, you're building up your supply. And like Aaron had mentioned earlier, you want to keep it on a constant rotation, have your newer products in the front and then rotate those out and make sure you're always having that rotation coming in. And in situations like this, as far as hoarding, no, baby, as far as hoarding is concerned, you have to take into consideration survival of your family. Self-preservation is key. And so if you're going to the store, oh, honey, thank you. If you're going to the store and doing it incrementally instead of going and getting large quantities of food, getting it two by two or when you get five boxes of pasta and if there's a coupon, get an extra. That's how I like to do that myself. Just a little bit. I'll be right back. Okay. Could I ask you that? Yes. Uh, I've got a problem with the term hoarding. Hoarding is the term that the government tried to put on people that was going out trying to buy products that they felt that they would need to get them through this crisis. A hoarder is a person that's gonna go out, for example, and buy a bunch of hand sanitizer and then later sell it at a higher price when, they're, when you're in the middle of the crisis. Someone that is thinking ahead knows that bad weather's coming for winter time, so they decide to put some extra canned goods up on the shelf, they take advantage of sales at grocery stores. They're buying a little bit each month so that they can have something to get them through in case something bad happened to me is common sense. That's not hoarding. I mean, even the term prepper, that was a term that Obama gave people in, in the movement. We were called survivalists. We wasn't called preppers. But when they labeled us as being uh, against society, enemies of the state almost, they put that stigma on us as being preppers. They also put the hoarding stigma on us. I've got a year's worth of toilet paper. Am I hoarding? No. I bought it ahead before everybody rushed to the store. The last minute people that rushed to the store and ran it out. Those are the people that were panic buying, not me. I've got it ahead of time. When they were rushing out, I sat at home and watched it on nationwide TV and kind of smiled to myself because I don't have to be out there pushing and shoving and having people ready to fight you 
over some toilet paper, over a can of peaches, or over a case of bottled water after a hurricane. I've already got it. So when, when you're stocking up, you're taking advantage of sales, you're just doing certain things, that's not hoarding. That, that's the stigma the government wants to put on you. That is common sense, and there's nothing illegal with thinking these days and trying to think ahead. If you don't, now you got to count on them for help. And you don't ever want to be in a position to count on the government to come and say, there's a, there's an acronym that we use in survival called YOYO. Y-O-Y-O means you're on your own. And that's what <laughs> you got to take. So I, I'm going to stop there. All right. We got some more comments. Uh, Renaissance Rich said, thank you. Ali said, KJ, it's a form of control hoarding for lack of a better term. Have about 90 days of food stored, hoarded, uh, 30 to 40 percent protein, and a rest between carbs and dried food. Uh, then those drinks mixes flavor. Lynn said, "How can you use? How can you use flax seeds?" Okay, an excellent way, as I have shared before, Lynn is using flax seeds as an eggs replacer. And then also, if you want to create a delicious treat for your children. I know that there are a lot of individuals who adopt a vegan or a vegetarian lifestyle. You can make your own quick jello and I would get your chia seeds. I would soak it in coconut milk or perhaps a delicious apricot guava nectar and sit it overnight in your refrigerator. And that seed, it's gelatinous. It's going to produce its own mucosa and then you can eat it the next day. I really like it over I know it might sound odd, a little bit of oatmeal, but again, you want to increase your fiber content. Another good way, and again, for us ladies, if you can't get to the store, you can take that flax gel and smooth <laughs> out those edges, get those edges nice and right. <laughs> we want to look nice. We don't, we don't want to give up our appearance, okay? Right, right. You want, to take, <laughs> you want to take that flax seed gel, sit it in some distilled water. Distilled water is excellent to use in crisis situations. And again, like Aaron said, you wanna keep any water and any of your teas, store them so that they don't have moisture. I live in an apartment, I'm in the South and sometimes your home can have a lot of humidity. And so with that, you have boxes and things that start to deteriorate over time. When you purchase your teas from the store, take them out of the box, put them in Ziploc bags, and use that, especially if you're going to use them right away. But in a crisis situation, like Aaron has shared before, you can do the same thing with teas. Put them in a mylar, ba mylar bag, use your oxygen ab absorbers, and then pull out that moisture. But I use these on a day-to-day -day basis. And so a good way to keep them from going bad, especially with the humidity in my home, I just take them out of the bag, put them in here, and then I just go that way. But that's a, some really good uses for flat seed. And if you want to add a little bit of carob to that, you can have yourself a little delicious pudding as well. Alrighty. And Ali said, uh, he's talking to Kay Jr. No, and like his sister says, now get a few every now and then. And if it's an issue with the amount you're buying for any provider, from any provider, for me and my two, it's not much, but a larger family, I see how. Um, mm -hmm. Then he said, exactly, control hoarding is prepping essential. Um, and then he said, good point, Aaron, derogatory notations of prepper. Daddy said, we are survivalists. <laughs> and then Ali said, yo, yo, are you on your own? Nice, Aaron, 10-4. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anybody else have any other questions? We're going to wrap it up in a little bit here. Um, did you guys have anything else you would like to talk about or well, I do want to mention one thing. Okay. As we get deep, as we get deeper into this crisis, there's going to be more product interruptions. There's going to be more uh, signs that things are running out. And one of the signs is they're going to limit the amount of purchases you're going to make. You're going to go to store. It's going to say one per person, two per person. Yeah, that's an obvious sign that things is running down. Now they're going to a rationing system to try to make sure as many people can get it as they can. If you can, you want to get around that, you go to one store, you buy your limit, you go to the next store, you buy your limit, and then you go to another store and you buy your limit. That way you can get what you and your family are going to need because no one's coming to help you. You are responsible for yourself and you're, and you're responsible for your family. 
And when something goes down, you want to be sitting in a position of confidence and know that you're ready for this. You don't want to, you don't want to let panic and, and fear consume you and consume your family. When everybody around you is panicking, saying, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it through this? Now, one person can step forward and say, don't worry about it. I got this. We're, we're ready for it. That, that's the person you want to be. And, and I'm going to let it go at that. Oh, yeah. one other thing. I, oh, if I can, whenever you want me to speak, Nadia. Go ahead. Go ahead. Something that is important to have on hand, extra garbage bags. You can see those. Yeah. Garbage bags are very important. They can be used for sanitation. They can also be used to take out garbage and refuse from your home. I would encourage you not to get the scented because, again, with the rodents and the <clears throat> Mice, well, that's the same thing, rodents and mice, but critters, you don't want to draw attention. So getting your soil diapers, things of that nature out of the home. And I know Aaron has those 10 gallon buckets. If you have to and your toilet is no longer working, take one of these garbage liners, put it in a bucket, have a seat and have a conversation. So it's just- <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna show that real quick while you guys talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm trying to be as modest and discreet as I can be. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to what Aaron was saying about the shortage, um, I noticed uh, still up until this point, um, certain grocery stores, when I go into them, things like butter, eggs, um, uh, bread are all like, Either you, you can only buy one or two or three, or they're, they're just not there. They don't have it. Um, it's a ration but, here. Yeah. Um, but I know I went to the Walmart here in uh, Evendale last week, and they were out of eggs again. Um, but with the eggs, you know, you can you can raise your own chickens. Most chickens are allowed in most areas, even in, uh, you know, residential urban areas now. So you can have backyard chickens. If you have a a laying hen, she's at least six months old in certain varieties like uh, Golden Comets or Rhode Island Reds. Um, those are very good for um, laying eggs. They'll lay an egg every day up until like fall and then they'll go into what is a molt where they, they won't lay for about, it, could be, it, it varies from about four weeks up to 12 weeks. Um, but up until that point, they'll lay an egg every day. So even if you have one chicken during a week, you'll have seven eggs. Um, so I always recommend people at least get two or three so you're constantly having an egg supply, especially if you like to consume eggs or you need you use eggs for a lot of things. Um, and then also, you know, you can also raise your own chickens for meat. They also have water broilers, but you can also eat those layers as well. So they, you know, they serve a dual purpose um, if you need them to do that. Um, things like butter, if you have, uh, if you buy, Heavy whipping cream, you can actually turn that into butter. Um, and I think I'm going to do a video about that. And yeah, you can do it in a jar or, you know, if you have a mixer or you can do it by hand. Um, but if you constantly whip it, eventually the, the fat that's in there will congregate together and it'll actually make butter. That's how butter is made from heavy whipping cream. Um, and then you have your, you can pour off the buttermilk. And if prior to it turning into butter, you can actually make whipped cream. So um, it's, it's, Think about, you know, buying heavy whipping cream. It lasts a lot longer than milk. Um, and you can do a lot of, you can make a lot of different products from that if you can't buy them at the store. And if that's available, you can make things from that. Um, and Aaron wants to show us his uh, handy dandy bucket potty. <laughs> All you do is you take a pool, a pool noodle or, and just line it around the toilet, <laughs> put your, uh, Little 10, 10 gallon uh, trash bag inside there. Put some chlorine bleach in it with some water, and it makes an improvised toilet. You just need a roll of toilet paper. And all these are what they call little, little pool noodles. Yeah. And they, they're designed to go right around the toilet. And you got an improvised toilet. Because if the, if the power goes out, and you guys are laughing, but I'm serious now, if the power goes out, the, the power to be able to pump water to your house is going to go down too. Right. If it goes down, and even if you're flushing your toilet, they're not pumping anything through the pipes to try to keep the pipes cleared out. That that uh, that poop or whatever is going to start backing up from the street, back to your house, back up your pipes, 
and then pretty soon Septic you, issues. you got a problem. Yeah. So to avoid that from happening, have you a couple pool noodles, have you some five gallon buckets, some chlorine bleach, and you got an improvised toilet. You can bury that stuff in the backyard, you can stick it into a uh, 55 gallon metal drum and you can burn it, whatever, whatever you want to do to get rid of it. But this is a this is a good way, simple, easy, and it's effective. And that's why I had shared before about having those extra plastic bags. You can add that to your 10 gallon bucket, add your pool, noodle, sit down, handle what you need to take care of, and dispose of it again because you want to avoid pests and animals. You want to tie it up tightly and then remove it away from your home. That right. way you're reducing odor, you're reducing things of that nature. Because again, your urine does contain salt and sugar and animals in desperate situations will smell it and you don't want that problem. So right. you want to again have your bags for garbage and things of that nature. Um, something that we didn't touch on, but it's also a part of food prep is paper towels, um, paper plates, silverware, things of that nature. But I'm from the old school. If you can go to the Dollar Tree while they still have them available, if you have five people in your family, get everybody a fork. So when you're rinsing that off, you are making sure that everybody has the utensils that they need because you don't want to have a lot of garbage. Let's look at this from a strategic perspective. You've got neighbors. They're watching you bring things in and out of your home. Garbage shows that you have food, you have resources. So you want to be very mindful of that as well. Yeah. All right. Lynn said, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I want to add to that because I have paper plates, plasticware, cups and things stocked up because in the event the power grid is down for extended period of time, there's no water coming to your house. Water is going to be a, it's going to be almost as valuable as gold. And you're not going to have a lot of water to take showers with or bathe with, let alone oh, wash clothes or wash dishes with. So if you've got the uh, means to be able to dispose, at, like, like I said, plastic cups, paper plates, plasticware, you don't have to wash no dishes. You don't have to expend water on that. So definitely, that's something you definitely want to have stocked up. Okay. If I uh, can add to that, what Aaron ahead. said about the water, Having some baby wipes is very important. I know that we only have the baby wipes when we have our babies, but when you don't have water to conserve your water to use for food preparation and for consuming as a drink, get yourself some baby wipes. Dollar Tree has them, get a few, and you can use those baby wipes to wash your body, the essentials, the underarm and the groin area to make sure that you're keeping yourself clean and that's very important, having those extra wipes and sanitize, sanitizing napkins. Oh, my computer's about to die. Just a minute. Okay. All right. Uh, Lynn said, thank you for the tips. OTCS said, I have had an overwhelming urge to can. I don't have a deep freeze, so I made the decision to can. Great. Um, just make sure um, if you're canning, make sure you're, you know, Maintaining the right pH and things like that so that you're not having any issues with microbial growth. Uh, OTCS also said it's a little pricey, but if you don't have room in your fridge to store food, then candy is a good option for food storage. Yes, it is. Um, I mentioned one thing, Nadia. On go that. ahead. Go ahead. Um, you can buy ball candy jars. Oh, those are excellent. You can fill it with rice. You can fill it with beans. You can fill it with spaghetti, grits, oatmeal. And then at the very top, you can put the oxygen absorber in, screw the lid down, but you want to have these very well cleaned. You want to dry them in your oven. You want to have them warm when you pour your products in. You want to make sure that they're sanitized. And when you pour your dry products in and screw the lid down and put the oxygen absorber on top, you'll hear the can make a little tink sound. All the air has been drawn out. And you can put these up on the shelf with rice and big sugar, flour, anything in them. And they will actually keep, but you want to keep the sunlight away from them, so put them in a cool, dry place. But you can actually just can dry products with these and use an oxygen absorber in the event you don't have mylar packs. Okay. Can you store water in the in the ball also? Do people store water in there? I've never tried it. Okay. They do have five gallon, you can store them in five gallon buckets. You can store them inside the mylar bags, from what I understand. 
but I've never tried it with the with the ball canning jars. But I mean, you you got plenty of probably empty pop bottle, two liter bottles laying around it. If you clean them out thoroughly and make sure they're they're clean, you can put water in them and put them up on the shelf. I was just thinking about you know the the plastic issue, you know, oh, okay. It, okay. yeah, uh, that that might you know help alleviate some of that. And it, uh, it would, it would, it would. Let's see here. Joe W. said pretty much. I'm not sure what that was for. Probably one of our potty jokes. Uh, Renaissance Riz said to laugh. Or he laughed. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if male female. Um, Joe W. said beef and chicken are in short supply. Yes, they are. Um, I've seen steaks. One steak go for $16. Oh. So, uh, yeah, there's a shortage in steaks um, and a lot of beef. Uh, they seem to restock their chicken here in Cincinnati at Kroger. They had a lot of chicken available. Um, but I didn't even look at the steak. I, I, stay, I stay away from that. I'm not paying that much for one steak. Um, so if you know if it costs that much at the grocery store, you can imagine how the price is going to be when the restaurants open back up. Um, Ali said chickens ASAP. Uh, as I get a yard, you can just shake cream a while and it makes butter. Yes. Uh, Ali said I didn't. Think about chlorinated water in the poop bucket bag. Um, <laughs> Ali also said you can make wipes with aloe, alcohol, and paper towels store in a plastic bag for a long time. Yes, you can do that. Um, also use like uh, washcloths and stuff. You can store them also. Um, just have to, you just have to, with all this stuff that's using moisture, like water or anything, uh, you probably want to store it in something that's dark colored so that uh algae doesn't doesn't grow but also you want to just check and make sure don't other microorganisms like fungi or anything are growing on this stuff because that is moisture is your worst enemy when it comes to microorganisms is that that just gives it the platform to grow on um so just be mindful of that and then renaissance risk said i'm going to start practicing now this is super awesome well thank you for tuning in renaissance risk all right so we we're closing in now on two hours so we're gonna cut it off now um but if you guys have any other questions or anything um you can contact aaron uh you want to give them your email address aaron yes it's uh olinger o-l-i-n-g-e-r at aol no olinger123 at aol.com and uh let's see you can hit me on Facebook. Uh, I prefer Facebook under Aaron Olinger. And uh, I, I think that'd be it. That'd be it. Okay. And how about you, Kyra? How can they get in contact with you? Yes. If you have any questions or comments or just want to know more healthy, nutritious ways to prepare your food, the T H E Healing Way, H E A L I N G, the Healing Way, 1973 at gmail.com. And if it takes me a while to respond, know that I'm not ignoring you. I just have a busy household and I'm taking care of myself and my children. And I will get back to you as soon as possible. Again, the healing way, 1973 at gmail.com. All righty. Um, I, I need to mention something else. I just, go ahead. just realized I gave the wrong uh, email. My, my email that I've got right now is olinger125 at aol.com, not one, two, three. All right, I'll put it in the comments. So if you guys want to contact them, you can email them directly. Um, and like Aaron had his social media on there. And Cairo is also on Instagram if you want to contact her on there. Um, if you guys need to contact me, you know, my information is always on here. But I'll put it in the comments as well. It's urbanfarmsister at gmail.com. Um, anything else? Any any other comments or anything before we head on out of here? Uh, make sure you guys subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you, you can watch this video later um, on YouTube. It also streams live on Facebook. So if you have a Facebook account, make sure you're following my Facebook page, uh, which is uh, also Urban Farm Sister. It's on Facebook. Um, you can see the video live pretty much instantly on there uh, if you have a Facebook account. It's no wait. Um, I guess once all this COVID-19 stuff uh, goes away, which I don't know when that's going to be. It seems they just keep prolonging this. Um, 
I think YouTube will be able to upload and get videos a lot faster onto the platforms. Uh, but for now, any live streams that I do is taking 12 hours for them to show up. Um, so just be mindful of that. Uh, like I said, if you have that link, uh, when I went out and shared it, you can click on that link at any point in time and it'll, it'll let you watch the video, but it just won't show up on my wall on my actual channel until tomorrow. Now it's going to be after nine, nine o'clock AM. Um, Ali said, thank you three. You're welcome. Ali, thank you for tuning in. And Miss Ebony said, thank you all. Great information again. Thank you, Miss Ebony for tuning in. I thank you too for coming on this evening and talking about You're all welcome. this awesome stuff. <laughs> you guys did a great well, job. Before you go, yeah. hard candies are good to help keep the mouth from being too dry. Chewing okay. gum, those are things that are helpful. And just having those, like Aaron was saying, comfort foods, the hard candies are good. And for those that are diabetic, get sugar free. Whenever you're purchasing your items from the grocery store, if you have those health concerns, reduce salt or sugar free or less sodium. Those are going to be things that are key to you. Just wanted to quickly bring that in. Because if okay. you can chew a little bit of gum, it'll keep you from being super hungry. Anything else, Aaron, before we sign out? Yeah, I want everybody to know that setting up a food and water pantry is key. It's the best investment you can make in yourself right now. With the uncertain times that we are living in, I don't care what happens. You're only going to last as long as you've got food and water. I don't care what type of equipment you got, how many guns you got, or whatever. When you run out of food and water, it's game over. So I cannot <laughs> overemphasize the importance of setting up a food and water pantry. It's a wrap. Yeah, I, I try to tell people that all the time, food and water – Food, water, and shelter are like vital. I mean, everything else, if you don't have those, you, you, you're in bad shape. So you got to have food, water, and shelter. Um, that's why I started this whole, you know, trying to get people more self-sustainable uh, back in uh, 2013. So I've been, I've been preaching this for a long time. And, you know, I, 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 I saw this time coming a long time ago. And I just kept trying to get people ready. But, you know, like I say, no time is better than the present. So guys now we got you got the information we got all types of videos that we put out um for all types of subjects so if you want to go back and watch those on my youtube you can um but just know that things are going to get worse before they get better um and, and you know you need to be prepared you need to start storing up uh you need to start canning if you're going to can if you're going to freeze it you need to get that freezer uh, if you're going to garden, you need to you need to start planting that stuff now, now that we're actually in the growth season so that you can have a harvest uh, as the summer progresses into fall. Um, if you have any questions on how to get started in that, you know, like I said, I have classes. I do consultations and things like that to help you set up, uh, get preparing for gardens, whether they're outside in soil or indoors in hydroponics or doing aquaponics. So I'm here to help. Kyra's here to help. So is Aaron. If you have any questions about anything we talked about this evening, just contact us. Um, let's see. Two more comments. Joe W. said, thank you guys for the information. It uh, It's my first time seeing you on YouTube, Nadia and Aaron. Well, thank you, uh, Joe, for tuning in. Appreciate you watching this evening. Uh, don't be a stranger. Come back. I, I, I'm on here a lot. Um, I, I have lots of videos coming up. Actually, tomorrow I'm going to do a video. I was supposed to do it yesterday. Um, but some stuff came up and I'm going to show you guys how to write up a grant proposal. Um, there's a lot of grant money out here right now, especially because of COVID-19. Um, so if you have nonprofits, but there's even grants for, you know, businesses, there's grants for individuals and things like that. But the first way, the only way you can get a grant is you have to have a proposal and you have to submit a proposal. Um, and so I'm going to show you guys how to, you know, write up a basic proposal, um, understanding the different parts and things like that. So, all the, all, I use my social media for good. I try to educate on a whole bunch of different subjects for a lot of different things that I have done. Um, like I said, I've been a disease investigator. I'm an entomologist, so I teach people about insects. I'm an urban farmer. Um, uh, you know, I've worked in research. I've worked in public health. I've gotten grants. I've wrote grants up, uh, proposals up and things like that. So I just try to share the knowledge that I have with the world. So that's what I do. Um, Joe said, I'm friends with you and Aaron, both on Facebook for years. Well, cool. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so, all right. So we'll be on here all night. And I know everybody got stuff to do. <laughs> so, again, if you want to contact us, if you have any questions, just reach out to our emails. And I will be back tomorrow talking about grants. 
Uh, and so if you can, tune in tomorrow. So everybody have a good evening. Thank you guys for have tuning in. Thank, Thank you, for Nadia, for having us. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. And y'all have, have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay.